All right, this is a lecture on the origin and evolution of the ocean floor. Okay, so after World War II, uh, a lot of the naval ships, American naval ships, were now equipped with all this new technology. Um, and instead of fighting wars, they decided to explore and start mapping the uh, sea floor. Um, prior to that, uh, <clears throat> a British naval um, expedition, uh, the HMS Challenger, which was captained by James Cook, um, over these four years collected a lot of oceanographic data. Um, essentially, th the way they uh, found out how uh, the depth to the ocean floor was by throwing a line overboard and seeing how far it would go until it hits the bottom. Uh, they call that um, sounding, essentially. Um, the more modern bathymetric techniques uh, use sonar. Sonar was developed out of necessity. Um, initially, it's, it's just sound that is shot from a device outward. Um, and initially, uh, it was used to detect icebergs ahead of ships. Right? There were some major tragic accidents in the North Atlantic that led to that. Um, but then they started to point it downwards. Okay? And so it uses sound energy. And that sound energy travels all the way to the bottom of the ocean floor and then reflects off the sea floor and comes back up. Uh, and uh, there's a receiver on the boat that will detect the reflect sound waves that come, that come back up. And because the velocity is uh, constant and something you can know, then uh, you can calculate um, the depth of the ocean floor by timing the reflection back from the ocean floor. So if it comes back faster, that means you're in shoaler water. And if it comes back longer, that means you're in deeper water. Okay. So early bathymetric profiles were created by uh, eco sounders. Okay. So here it goes. Here's the outgoing signal. It kind of goes downward um, and then hits the sea floor and then is reflected back. And you have a receiver at the other end of the boat. Okay. Um, Afterwards, uh, after World War II, uh, we started to develop better technology or uh, side scan sonar, and that kind of produced an image of the seafloor. So before we were just kind of blind. We were just like, oh yeah, the sea is, you know, 300 fathoms deep, right? That's all we could say. But now we can actually see it. Um, later on, high resolution multi beam sonar was developed, okay, and that sends a fan of sand out. Like a, basically like a swath, okay, um, and so uh, it kind of looks like uh, this right here. Here's side scan sonar. This would develop those images, um, and here's multi beam sonar, and it basically sends a swath of uh, information outwards and is collected. And the boat has to kind of uh, turn around and overlap certain areas to get a, a better or more complete. Um, uh, bathymetric profile of the ocean floor, and that's what that's what bathymetry means. Bathymetry is the understanding of the the contours and the topology of the ocean floor. Okay, this is off the coast of uh, Long Beach. Um, here is uh, basically L.A., and then you go off the beach. This is the continental shelf and the steep uh, uh, slope that leads on to the abyssal plains deeper into the Pacific. So. By being able to send ships out and uh, using multi-beam sonar or side-scan sonar, they were able to map in great detail places right on uh, continental margins. Okay, uh, another major development was uh, were uh, satellites. Have, satellites are equipped with radar altimeters, and those can measure small variations in the ocean surface. And so what happens is if you have a major feature on the ocean floor, um, water is going to pile up on top of it. And it's going to create a little anomaly on the sea surface. And it's not much of an anomaly, but it can be picked up by radar altimeter, uh, altimeters because they have uh, they can measure their capability of measuring. They get down to like the millimeters. OK, so these are really subtle uh, anomalies on the ocean floor. And they're created by large features on the ocean floor. Okay, so say this is like a seamount or kind of like a, a mountain that sticks out of the ocean floor. There's an, uh, uh, an anomalous amount of water that'll sit on top of it because it exerts a little more gravity than the surrounding seafloor. 
And so we can resolve that difference using satellites uh, and predict what's on the ocean floor. And that's how we construct um, the beautiful Google ocean floor satellite images that you can see if you go online. Okay, and so with all this new technology, with all the mapping, the, the detailed mapping with side scan sonar, uh, that's great. You can find like shipwrecks and um, you know really small C4 fleet features, um, but that type of mapping is uh, very intense and expensive because you have to send the boat out there with the crew, process all that data, and it really covers a small portion of the ocean floor. Um, so only 5% of all of our oceans are mapped to that detail. The rest, we just use the satellite data, okay? Um, because the oceans are so big, really. Um, and so through all of this uh, bathymetric profiles uh, and understanding the ocean floor, being able to map it through the various techniques, there are three major provinces of the ocean floor. There are continental margins, right? That's the transition from uh, continental crust above the oceans to uh, the ocean basins. Okay, then there are the deep ocean basins. Those are between the margins and the ocean ridge. And then there's the ocean ridge. And that the ocean ridge essentially is just a long linear mountain chain uh, that we essentially discovered in the 1950s. Okay, so here's a cross section of the Atlantic Ocean Basin. Okay, so here um, we're going from somewhere in the Northeast, Massachusetts, all the way to uh, West Africa. And the Atlantic Ocean Basin is uh, very symmetrical. It's very nice because you can go from one continental margin to another and it kind of repeats itself right at the center of the mid-ocean ridge here. Okay, so if you start off in Massachusetts, this is the continental margin. You have a continental shelf. These are our coastal waters. Leads into a, a continental slope here. Then there's a little bump here called the continental rise where a lot of sediment that's derived from land gets deposited. Um, and then it bleeds out into the deep ocean, ocean basin and this is the abyssal plain. All right, these are the flattest places of the ocean floor. On average, the deepest, but not the deepest parts of the ocean floor. Um, and then as you leave the deep ocean basin province, you start kind of going uphill um, and you go uphill towards the center of the mid ocean ridge. Okay. And the mid ocean ridge has, has a bunch of little valleys, but then there's a central valley right at the center. And that's where all the volcanic eruptions occur. Pillow basalts kind of spill out on the sea floor there. Um, some of those uh, ridge walls can be pretty high. Okay. The elevation change from the bottom of the abyssal plain uh, to the top of the mid-ocean ridge can be as, uh, as high as 1.5 kilometers. So that's pretty big. Okay, once you get past the middle rift valley, then you start going downhill again to the uh, adjoining abyssal plain right off the coast of Africa. And then as the abyssal plain ends, it bleeds into the continental rise, then the slope, and then the shelf. And so it's nicely symmetrical on either side. All right, and we refer to uh, these margins of North America and Africa as passive margins. Those are passive continental margins. They're geolog geologically inactive. The plate boundaries are very far away, and that's why we don't feel any earthquakes in Florida, okay, um, or it's very rare. Um, so a passive margin is found essentially all along the Atlantic coast. We experience little, uh, really no volcanism. The only, the closest volcanism to us is uh, in the Caribbean, okay? And so this is what's typical of a passive margin. You have a uh, continental shelf, right? And then you have, um, uh, and continental shelves are just flooded portions of the continent. Um, and then here you have uh, submarine canyons that cut right through it. Some of these are as large as the Grand Canyon or even bigger, okay? And that bleeds right into the continental slope, very steeply sloping area which then leads to the rise where a lot of sediment is deposited in these deep sea fans. Okay, so that continental shelf, that's where our coastal waters are. It's essentially a part of the continent, but it's just flooded. Sea level is high. We're in an interglacial period, so sea level is rising, and it floods the continent, and that's the continental shelf. Uh, when Earth goes through its glacial cycles, if we're in a, gla uh, a cooler period, um, sea level will fall and more of the continental shelf will, will be exposed as land. Um, these areas contain uh, 
really important uh, mineral and oil deposits. That's why a lot of times we have offshore platforms over there. Uh, when sea level's lower, there are a lot of glacial deposits out on the continental shelf. Um, <clears throat> and today, they're very important fishing grounds. In fact, that's where we do most of our uh, commercial fishing is on the continental uh, shelf. Uh, after the continental shelf, there's a steep drop-off. That's the slope. Okay, very steep structure. Uh, marks the boundary between the contin continental and ocean crust. Okay. Uh, the inclination of the slope varies depending on where you are. It's anywhere between 5 and 25 degrees, okay? And that bleeds directly into the continental rise. And the continental rise is like a thick accumulation of sediment derived from land. And the, the way the sediment arrives there is through these underwater avalanches of um, dense uh, kind of water mixed with sediment, like a slurry. Uh, and it kind of flows down those submarine canyons, okay? Um, and then it emerges on the flat abyssal plains, and then the sediments just uh, settle out and deposit. And that creates what we refer to as a deep sea fan. Okay, and so the rise is uh, composed of multiple avalanches of deep sea fans depositing, uh, depositing one on top of another. Okay, so here they are. Here are those deep sea fan deposits. And so the next one will just, just deposit right on top of it. Okay, active continental margins are a little different. We can go to the west coast of the United States to see what an active margin would be like. Uh, that's the Pacific Northwest over here where the Cascades are, um, Central America, and pretty much the entire west coast of South America. That's an active continental margin. And what that means is there's active tectonic plate convergence there. There's subduction, and this changes the uh, ocean basin surrounding the continents here, or the ocean margins. Okay, so in an active continental margins, um, sediments and rocks, those can be scraped off the descending plate and they can accumulate on the continental plate. And it creates an entire, entirely new landform. We call that an accretionary wedge. I'll show you a picture in a second. Okay, what can also occur too, and this is dependent on the subduction angle of the subducting plate, but you can have subduction erosion. Okay, and that's when sediment is scraped off the overriding plate and like basically goes on a ride with the subducting plate into the mantle. So check this out. So here are the two situations. Here's a subducting ocean plate, right? And it's subducting at a low angle. And the reason why it's subducting at a low angle is because it's relatively young subducting crust, okay? Um, so this is just a zoom in of what's going on here. This is a convergent plate boundary. Think Central America, Pacific Northwest, or, or uh, Western South America. And then you have subduction, okay? So again, you have, here's the continental volcanic arc. This here is considered the coastal waters or the uh, continental shelf. And the continental shelf just kind of uh, bleeds right into the slope. And the slope goes into the trench, okay? And then here's, this is the trench area. So there aren't any continental rises on active margins, okay? There can be an accretionary wedge, which essentially is like as this subducting plate moves downwards, it just scrapes the sediment that's on the, the uh, subducting ocean crust and deposits it in as this as a feature here on the continental crust. Or if you're subducting really old ocean crust, old ocean crust is more dense and heavier Therefore, the subduction angle is greater, so it just goes straight down. And then all the ocean sediment goes along with it, and it can actually erode portions of the continental crust and take it for a ride down into the mantle. And in that case, you won't have the development of an accretionary wedge. Instead, you'll have a deep ocean trench. Okay, and these are the deepest parts of the entire ocean right here. Okay, so... We've talked about the continental margins. Now let's move on to the deep ocean basin. Okay, the deep ocean basin includes deep ocean trenches, like I showed you in the previous image. Here is, uh, this is Puerto Rico, and this is the uh, Puerto Rican trench here. Okay, um, that's the one of the deepest parts of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, in deep ocean basins, there are also abyssal plains. Um, these are relatively flat areas where a lot of uh, really fine sediment accumulates. Um, and then they can be dotted by uh, seafloor volcanism uh, with seamounts and guyats. We'll talk about those. 
And then there are also, uh, also related to volcanism, there are also ocean plateaus, relatively flat and thickened areas of the ocean crust. All right, so deep ocean trenches are just creases uh, along the sea floor. It's almost like uh, a giant, you know, it's a trench or a scar on the ocean floor. And these are the deepest parts of the ocean. The Challenger Deep um, is right off the Marianas Islands in the Western Pacific. And that's the deepest spot of our entire ocean. That's almost 11 kilometers below sea level. You can kind of remove Mount Everest and place it right there in the Challenger Deep spot and it'll sink all the way and not break the sea surface. It could fit there. That's how deep that is, okay? Um, a deep ocean trench is a surface expression of a subduction zone. So essentially a subducting plate is submerging into the mantle and that deep area just represents, you know, where that ocean crust is going, okay? And then it's associated with volcanic activity. Like if there's ever subduction, you're gonna find either volcanic island arcs, uh, volcano or volcanic islands on the overriding plate, or you're gonna find uh, continental volcanic arcs, which is if the overriding plate is continental crust, then you'll find volcanoes on land, essentially. Most of these deep ocean trenches are found in the Pacific, and that's because we find most of the uh, subduction zones along the Pacific Ocean Plate. Okay, so here's the Challenger Deep Area. Here's Guam. Marianas Islands are pretty close by, but this is the deepest part of our ocean. <clears throat> okay, abyssal plains are just flat features of the ocean floor, the most level places on Earth, and they're the most level because they accumulate really fine particles of sediment that are drifting out to sea far away from land, and then they slowly settle to the bottom of the ocean floor. Some of that sediment will take 50 years before it settles on the bottom of the ocean floor. So there's the, And these areas have been around for, for a really long time, millions of years, so it has thick accumulations of sediment, really fine sediment. Um, and they're delivered by those turbidity currents. Occasionally, um, you can find minerals that precipitate directly from seawater, like uh, manganese nodules, um, or uh, the shells of uh, microscopic marine plankton. Um, they create their armor or their shells or tests in the upper sunlit layers of the ocean, and when they die, all those tests kind of uh, sink down to the bottom of the ocean floor, and they can accumulate and create sediment. Okay, the most extensive ones are found in the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, here's a seismic reflection profile. And what that essentially is, is this is an explosion that's gone off and seismic waves can travel through uh, many layers of sediment and then return back to a receiver. And what that does is allows scientists to collect data um, of the subsurface of the ocean floor. So not just the kind of topology of the uh, of the ocean floor, like finding out where are the, you know, valleys and ridges and sea mounts and stuff like that. But we can also see beyond the surface and look at the layering. And what we know about the abyssal plain is, look, this, these are those thick accumulations of sediment. And the ocean crust, here's the uh, ocean crust itself. This is the basalt. It's highly irregular because it's volcanic in origin. Okay. And then the sediment just drapes on top of it and hides the kind of uh, jaggedness of the ocean crust. And occasionally you have ocean crust stick out in these volcanic peaks. We'd call those seamounts. So seamounts are essentially uh, volcanic features, okay? They can be volcanic islands. Uh, if the activity subsides, they start to uh, shrink, and diminish, okay? Over a million seamounts exist on the ocean floor. They're found everywhere. They're most common in the Pacific. Um, and they form near ocean ridges, right? Because ocean ridges are those divergent plate boundaries where there's extensive uh, normal faulting and extension and a lot of volcanism, okay? Um, <clears throat> and they can grow large enough to become a volcanic island. Great examples of this are Easter Island, Tahiti, Bora Bora, Galapagos, Hawaii. Those are uh, volcanic islands that form um, as a result of volcanic activity on the ocean floor. Guyats are essentially uh, volcanic features, um, but then they're flat topped. That's the only difference. And so what happens is this emerged above the ocean as a volcanic island, then the activity stopped and the ocean just basically eroded the top of this volcano and flattened it out, okay? And then the last feature of the deep ocean basin are ocean plateaus. 
And ocean plateaus are interesting because essentially what they are, um, they're when a hot spot moves through the mantle and uh, decompresses and melts and vast outpourings of basalt come out and just spread all over the sea floor. Um, and as they do, they just kind of uh, just blanket the sea floor and thicken the ocean crust. They resemble continental flood basalts. So think of the Deccan Traps or uh, the Columbia River basalts. I think we've talked about that before. Okay. Okay, the last province of the ocean floor are the ocean ridges, okay, or the mid ocean ridges. Okay, they're a rise, a broad kind of swell, a mountain chain essentially in the middle of the ocean. They're the longest topographic feature on Earth. They cover about 22% of the ocean floor. And it's crazy. We didn't even know they existed until the 50s, 1950s. Their width kind of varies widely. They're either they're from 1,000 to 4,000 kilometers thick. They're occupying elevated positions, as we talked about before. And the segments where there are spreading centers are offset by transform faults, okay? So there's extensive faulting, earthquakes, volcanic activity, okay? And at the center of these spreading centers are these rift valleys. These are down faulted structures. Uh, and at the bottom of the valley floors, that's where you see the volcanism. And their width can range from 30 to 50 kilometers. And then those canyon walls that mark the kind of rift valley floor, the edge of them, they can be as tall uh, as two and a half kilometers above the valley floor, or 500 meters to 2.5 kilometers. All right, so here are the locations of uh, all the uh, ocean ridge systems. So here in the Atlantic, uh, they go essentially from the North Atlantic all the way to here. Um, here's the Pacific. Here's the Southeast Indian Ridge, Mid-Indian Ridge. And if you noticed, um, they're in different colors, and that's because not all, not every ocean ridge system is the same. They spread at different rates. We have slow spreading ridges, typically two, oh god, to three centimeters a year. Intermediate is like seven to nine centimeters a year, and then fast spreading ridges uh, can be like 12 to 18 centimeters per year is the rate at which they create new ocean crust. Okay. So seafloor spreading, that was a concept we talked about in plate tectonics, but it was formulated early in the 1960s by Harry Hess after they started collecting a lot of convincing data when they started mapping the ocean floor and collecting paleomagnetic data, okay? But seafloor spreading occurs at the uh, rift valleys of these ocean ridges. So newly formed melt forms from the decompressing and rising asthenospheric mantle, okay? Um, and then uh, most of that solidifies and becomes part of the ocean crust, the lower crust, as gabbro. Uh, but some of it escapes and erupts on the sea floor. It comes into contact with that really cold ocean water uh, as um, basalts. Okay. So <clears throat> the way the ocean ridges, their topo the topology, they're at like a raised, elevated position. And the reason is, is because uh, it's hot. It's a volcanic area, there's newly created lithosphere, it's less dense than the surrounding rock, so it's pushed upwards, okay? And each type of spreading ridge, based on their spreading rate, has different topology. Okay, slow spreading rates uh, in ocean ridges, uh, the, what you have in those ridges is that they have well-developed rift valleys and very rugged topography, okay? If you have intermediate spreading ridges, like the Chile Rise, as an example, seven to nine centimeters a year, the spreading, uh, you have a, a more subdued rift valley. It's there, but it's a little more subdued. Um, and then if you have really fast spreading ridges, like the uh, Pacific Rise, um, they don't have any rift valley. They actually have kind of like a swell. Let's look at a cross section. Okay, so this is the topology of uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge well-developed rift valley in the center, um, and then uh, here we go, spreading outward. So this is just a, a model of one of the uh, rift valleys, but let's take a, a look at the, at a, at a, the difference between, um, this would be the uh, East Pacific rise. So out in the Pacific, this is a fast spreading center. So instead of a rift valley, you have a swell, right? And the reason is it's spreading so much faster 
um, there's a greater volume of magma making it to the surface. So you have a, a, a magmatic chamber that's very close to the surface. Okay, more partial melts are coming up, um, and that causes this area to swell upwards. Okay, remember, this is spreading faster, um, some places 18 centimeters per year. This is more like the Atlantic, a slow spreading ridge. So in a slow spreading ridge, uh, you don't really have a, a giant magma chamber near the surface. Um, and you have uh, very slow spreading development of a lot of normal faults, okay, uh, a rift valley, huge uh, canyon walls here, okay. Let's take another look. Um, this is a good cross section of all three. So this is this here would be the slow spreading mid Atlantic ridge, two centimeters, two to three centimeters per year. Okay, you can see a well developed rift valley here, high valley walls. Intermediate, you do see a rift valley here but the walls aren't as high, okay? And as expected, um, with faster spreading, you would have uh, your, your uh, an equivalent, let's say three million year old rock would be further away from the center of the rift than at a slower spreading ridge, okay? And then at something like a really fast spreading ridge, uh, no rift valley at all, you just see a little swell, and then your three million year old rock is all the way out here, and that's because this is spreading much faster. Okay, so let's talk about the ocean crust. The ocean crust comes in uh, four layers. The reason why we know this is because occasionally there's some, uh, um, because of plate tectonics, uh, when there's a convergent plate boundary, sometimes the leading portion of an ocean plate gets pushed up onto the continent. We call that abduction. And so that pushes ocean crust onto land. And then geologists go out and find it and they're like, oh my God, this is ocean crust. And then they can take a look at the layers and then we can talk about it, right? We call those ophiolite complexes, okay? And so the ophiolite complexes that we've found typically have these four layers, and this is what we believe to be the layers of the ocean crust at mid-ocean ridges. Um, the first layer is just deep sea sediments, and we know this, we don't need to look at ophiolites to know this. We see a lot of sediments accumulating on the abyssal plains, okay? And uh, sedimentary rocks below that layer are pillow lavas, okay? Pillow lavas are the uh, basalts that make it and touch the cold sea water and crystallize almost instantaneously. They form those kind of like circular bulb-shaped pillows. Um, I'll show you in the next slide. Um, and then there, below that is the sheeted dike complex. And these are also basalts that are just kind of like injections of basalt as they're moving upwards and then they kind of crystallize and shrink a little bit to form these uh, dikes. And then below that is the uh, intrusive equivalent of basalt, which is gabbro, okay? Let me show you a picture. So here's your sediment, okay, there's jaws. Here are your pillow basalts, here are your sheeted dikes, and here's your gabbro, okay, in this section. Uh, and then this is your mantle and peridotite. So this is a cross section of the ocean crust. Okay, so how does the ocean crust form? Well, basaltic magma originates from uh, decompressing, rising asthenospheric mantle, and that's peridotite, that's the rock uh, in the mantle. Um, so it rises up through these tiny, tiny cracks until it reaches a magmatic chamber beneath the mid-ocean ridge or the ridge crest. And as the pressure increases from all the newly generated magma coming from beneath, um, rock fractures and uh, melts can make it towards the surface. And these are pillow basalts. This is a cross section of a pillow basalt, okay? So the magma ascends through those uh, sheeted dike complexes that helps uh, uh, accommodate vertical movement uh, of these basaltic melts. And only 10 to 20% of the magma that's generated at mid-ocean ridges actually makes it uh, uh, to the surface as pillow basalts, or close to the surface as pillow basalts. Okay, um, seawater and the ocean crust interact a lot, uh, and the reason is because the ocean crust right at mid-ocean ridges is really hot, it's fresh, there are a lot of permeable and highly fractured portions of the crust, there are a lot of normal faults, and that allows seawater to kind of percolate inwards into the crust. And that can, the interaction exceeds two to three kilometers of the ocean crust, okay? And the things you have to remember, this is really hot rock. A lot of this is really close to 
uh, magmatic chambers or dikes and sills that are forming through the ocean crust. And so what that does is that really heats the seawater and causes circulation. Okay, and so what happens is you have uh, hydrothermal metamorphism occurring uh, in the ocean crust. Okay, and so that hot groundwater circulates. It gets hot, its density decreases, and then it rises up and erupts at a lot of different vents. And these vents build up uh, into what we refer to as black smokers. I think I got a picture. No, I don't. The black smokers are just kind of vents that can be like 60 feet tall, and they spew out this black cloud of superheated water. And it's coming out like the ocean water surrounding it is like two or three degrees Celsius, super cold, and the water coming out of these vents right at the mid-ocean ridge, um, these black smokers, it's coming, this black water shooting out at 350 degrees Celsius. That's three and a half times the temperature of boiling water. Okay. All right, so let's talk about how ocean basins form, okay? The o evolution and birth of an ocean basin, so to speak. And it really, it starts off with um, the formation of a continental rift, okay? And a continental rift is just on continental crust that starts to separate apart, you start forming an elongated depression where the lithosphere is stretched and thinned, okay? Um, this is occurring in a lot of different areas on Earth today. The East African Rift is the best example of an, a uh, an active continental rift. The Rio Grande Rift near te in Texas, um, Rhine Valley and the Baikal Rift, okay? so. When the lithosphere is thin and hot, these rift valleys can be very wide. One example of this is the Basin Range Province, very thin portion of the American crust here. All right, the East African Rift is the best example because it's very active. The crust is so thin there that melts are actually making it to the surface and there's actual volcanism here. Okay, so there is a lot of basaltic flows and a lot of cones that are forming in the East African Rift. Okay, so here it is. This is the rift. This portion of East Africa is moving in this direction. This portion of Africa is moving in that direction. And that creates these depression or stretch marks on the earth um, that occur all in this area. Over geologic time, this entire area is going to move out into the Indian Ocean. Okay, it's going to be like Madagascar 2.0. Okay, um, and if we, we zoom in a little closer, you can see that this area is dotted with a lot of volcanism. Okay. The Red Sea is a cool example of um, what the East African Rift is going to be in, in the future, like geologic future, because uh, the Arabian Peninsula was once part of Africa 30 million years ago, and a continental rift formed. And uh, it split that landmass into the Arabian Peninsula and uh, northeastern Africa. Okay, And as that rift continued to grow, as it continues to grow, the rift grows wider and the ocean comes in and fills that area, and that's what the Red Sea is today, okay? And if that continues to happen, a whole ocean basin will form, and that's how the Atlantic Ocean formed. The Atlantic Ocean formed as a result of the breakup of Pangaea. 200 million years ago, uh, when Pangaea began first rifting apart, continental rifts started to form and break up this large uh, uh, mega continent, and as it did, first started forming like a very thin crust, rift valley like you see in East Africa. Then it continued to rift and grow a narrow sea filled in between North America and Africa. And as it continued to kind of rift apart, it was a whole new ocean basin with two passive continental margins. So here you can see that evolution. Here it's South America and Africa. Okay, so this would be like modern day um, East Africa, right, with the upwarping. Um, here's the Rift Valley with volcanism over time, right? It gets lower and lower with a thinning lithosphere, okay? Then you get a linear sea, like what you would see in the Red Sea today, okay? So this is that small linear sea that forms as the rifting continues, okay? And then a full-blown ocean basin uh, over hundreds of uh, millions of years, uh, over 200 million years in this case, um, and then this is the Atlantic Ocean Basin with two passive margins. That's how that happens. Okay, so with the birth of a new ocean basin, a lot of geologists start thinking, like, is this a normal occurrence? 
how does this work over longer periods of geologic time? Remember, Pangaea is only the past 200 million years, and the Earth has been around for 4.6 billion years. So they kind of wondered, like, uh, what's occurred before Pangaea? Does this happen regularly? Um, so they think there's a supercontinental cycle, okay? So this is uh, how uh, continents form or supercontinents form and then disperse. So they kind of like uh, uh, a supercontinent will form, then it will rift, disperse, then later join and come back together, then disperse once more. And it's true. Geologically, uh, we have evidence of past supercontinents, at least two. Their Pangaea was just the most recent. There was Ro Rodinia was an older supercontinent, okay? And so um, <clears throat> this may be related, uh, or excess rifting may be related to mantle plumes and hot spots, okay? So regions in the mantle that are really hot and rise and create these super plumes and that create a lot of melting or decompression melting, think of like the stuff that's going on in Hawaii. Um, this may be triggered by uh, increased subduction as a result of continental rifting of a major supercontinent. Okay. Um, so a lot of times what we notice, there is a pattern of flood basalts precede uh, a rifting event. Okay. So these are the, the Paraná basalts that are found in uh, East Africa and in South America. Um, and <clears throat> these flood basalts formed about 130 million years ago, just before the South Atlantic began to open. So a lot of times um, we'll see these flood basalts form, and then that leads into a continental rift. Okay. So today, this is what we have today, the Paraná basalts in South America and East Africa. Here's the Tristan hotspot. Um, but we have uh, the formation of that ocean basin. So uh, perhaps mantle plumes that are moving uh, up through the mantle are what cause these continental rifts. Okay, and if we see uh, a lot of the other areas um, that have uh, major um, uh, flood basalt, the timing of these flood basalts, and then after that they're preceded by um, uh, intense volcanism. So the Deccan Traps, there was uh, in the North Atlantic province, there was flood basalts before um, uh, uh, major volcanic eruption and rifting. So this is held true in a number of different cases. So geologists think that there's a connection between continental rifting and mantle plumes rising up and forcing uh, uh, the rifting of land. Okay. Um, occasionally, these mantle plumes can produce uh, three rifts, and we call this a triple junction. But what eventually happens is one of the arms becomes a failed rift, and uh, um, w one end of it just becomes the predominant rift. Okay. So sometimes, uh, and in addition to that, sometimes mantle plumes don't always lead to rifting. Uh, for example, the, the the flood basalts, the Columbia River basalts in the Pacific Northwest. There was no rifting after that. And there was also failed rifting uh, in the Midwest. Okay. Okay. So whenever you have um, uh, tensional stress in crust um, where it thins out uh, and it's, it gets really hot, that can initiate spreading. So uh, in the Basin and Range province, which is a portion of Nevada, right? So there's that. Nevada kind of looks like, nope. <laughs> um, what will happen is uh, different tectonic um, uh, circumstances can cause rifting. So um, if you have slab pool from subducting plates, that can create tensional stress and initiate rifting. Okay. Let's see if I got a figure to go with that. Nope. Okay. So ocean lithosphere or what's the fate of ocean crust when it subducts? Um, well, why? let's ask the question, why does ocean lithosphere subduct? Well, the easy answer is that um, it subducts because it's denser than continental crust. So if it comes into contact with ocean crust or continental crust, the denser 
lithosphere will sink into the mantle, and that's what initiates the subduction. Okay, um, the fate of ocean crust or um, where it goes after it's subducted, um, that's under debate. Um, but seismologists, uh, through uh, seismic studies, and they study the seismic waves that move through the interior of the Earth, they, um, they have evidence that suggests that they may subduct all the way to the core mantle boundary. Um, others suggest that uh, it piles up between the upper and lower mantle. Okay, um, So essentially, the density of the ocean crust has to be greater than the underlying asthenosphere in order for subduction to initiate. So it's all about density of, of the lithosphere. Okay, There's also something referred to as spontaneous subduction. So if you have a passive margin and you have really old con uh, ocean crust, it can become so dense that it disconnects from uh, like the uh, continental crust and just starts to sink. That's just uh, subduction initiation, essentially. And because the ocean crust is so old, it's so dense, it subducts at nearly 90 degrees. The best example of this is the Marianas Trench. Okay, and that's where the lithospheric mantle, uh, I mean, that's where the uh, ocean lithosphere just dives right into the mantle. Okay, so this is an example of the Marianas Trench. Old, uh, cold lithosphere is very dense, and so it, all it takes is just a little push, and then boom, it goes subduct straight into the stenosphere. When you're subducting um, really young ocean crust, so you can assume this is young because this ocean crust is very close to where it's created at the mid-ocean ridge, um, then the subduction angle will, will be shallower. Okay, so if you have young uh, ocean lithosphere, it's much warmer, it's much more buoyant, so it kind of it kind of like uh, rides underneath the overriding plate, still subducts. In some cases, the subduction angle is so shallow that there will be no generation of magma, and that's the case in some parts of northern Chile. Okay, yeah, this is, and that's forced subduction. That's when younger, less dense lithospheres force beneath an overriding plate. So that results in a lot of um, uh, frequent and strong earthquakes it can actually thicken the upper plate. It's almost like a mountain building process. Essentially, it is. And that's a, a, a big portion of the Peru-Chile trench. Let's see if I got a picture. Nope. OK. Um, so uh, the uh, former plates or subducting plates, what, what happens to these ancient ocean basins? Well, um, if the plate is subducting faster than the ocean crust is being produced, the mid-ocean ridge will subtu subduct completely, and then you lose every, you lose the entire kind of system. And that was true of the Farallon plate. And and uh, uh, what happened there is that the the Farallon mid-ocean ridge was subducted, and then the plate boundary became the San Andreas transform boundary. So let me show you a picture of that. This so this is 56 million years ago. This was the ocean plate that was subducting underneath Western North America. Okay, so it was a subduction zone, and here are the spreading centers. But it was subducting quicker than ocean crust was being created. So those mid-ocean ridges boop, just disappeared underneath the North American plate. And then this convergent plate boundary turned into a transform plate boundary. Okay, and so this is the uh, modern uh, San Andreas fault today. All right, thank you.